Hey guys, Brian Douglas here from Control System Lectures. Now I know normally on my channel we're talking about classical control theory, but have you ever asked the question, what's going on today in research that's pushing the boundaries of our knowledge of control system theory? Well that's why I'm here at the University of Washington in Seattle, and we're going to go visit the Robotics, Aerospace, and Information Networks Laboratory, where the students and researchers there are solving problems that have never been solved before. So let's go inside and check it out and see if we can learn something. All right, here we are at the RAIN lab, and this is the team that is advancing the field of robotic swarms and how humans interact with those swarms. They've got a lot of cool demonstrations to show, so let's get to it. Actually, before we jump in and start talking about their cutting edge research, let's set the stage a bit and talk about a little bit of background information first. Let's say you've just purchased a quadcopter and you enjoy flying it outside. You send it commands from your remote control, directing it to move around but you soon find that the wind gusts are unpredictable and you aren't fast enough to maintain the position that you want. So you spend a little time and some ingenuity and you design an onboard automatic control system that uses GPS and an altimeter. And the control system sends the correct commands to the motor to maintain the reference position, even in the presence of wind. Now all you need to do is send a new reference command to the quadcopter and the onboard control system will take care of the rest. But you soon grow tired of watching your lone quadcopter hover perfectly in midair, so you purchase two more quadcopters and install the exact same software on them. Now you can perform formation flying with your three vehicles by sending a different reference command to each. However, you find that sending a command to each robot individually is tedious and frankly pretty hard for a single person, and you think to yourself, I wish I could just send a single command to my group of robots, and then they can figure out how to fly in formation on their own. And this is exactly the problem that the field of swarm robotics is solving. Swarm robotics deals with the coordination of multi-robot systems. The idea is that by setting relatively simple individual rules that each robot can follow, a desired global behavior emerges. A well-known example of emergent behavior is Conway's Game of Life. Here, pixels seem to take on lives of their own based on just a few simple rules. And so it stands to reason that we can get swarms of robots to take on lives of their own with a similar set of simple rules. But before you can just start developing your set of rules on a complex vehicle, it's sometimes best to develop a simple model and simulate the behavior first. The simplest model of a moving robot is a particle, a massless, volumeless point. This may seem uninteresting at first, but starting with a particle model allows you to develop consensus algorithms, or algorithms that govern how the robots will coordinate and agree with each other on a common goal, without having to worry about the exact dynamics of the robots themselves. And one reason for this is because a point can move in any direction, and so that simplifies the equations. For example, if you have two particles and your consensus algorithm wants to pull them together, you don't have to worry about orientation since the particles can move in every direction. So all you have to worry about is how to set the pressure between your points to get them to move the way you want. An omnidirectional robot can emulate a particle model as long as you ignore nonlinear effects like motor saturation and friction, which means you can actually use a real robot to test out your consensus algorithms rather than relying on simulations or models. And the folks at the RAIN lab have built an omnidirectional robot they call Sheila just for that purpose. Let me show you visually how some of the simpler algorithms do this, by modeling a spring system between the two points. Here my wooden pucks represent individual robotic agents. If the points get too far away, the virtual spring system pulls them together. If they get too close, the spring pushes them away. By affecting the virtual spring coefficients, you can manipulate the behavior between the two robots. The nice thing about a model like this is that it expands very easily to a larger group of robots. We can add more agents with the exact same logic and start to develop shapes and patterns of robotic swarms with very simple underlying rules. Move closer to my neighbor, move further from my neighbor. So what are these guys doing right now? Uh, they're all trying to get, uh, I want to say it's about 50 centimeters away. If I get too close, the other guys will actually back up and try to avoid so that they get back in, into formation. Can generate pathological cases where they try to <laughs> avoid each other in the moment. Again, this is the simplest consensus algorithm, but you can see how this would work by sending just a single command and have the desired group behavior. 
You could send your reference command to one robot and all of the other robots would follow as if being pulled by a virtual spring. This is a way of controlling consensus through a ground node, or in other words, by forcing one robot to go to a particular location, you've effectively anchored him there, and the other robots have no option but to rendezvous at that same point. Up to this point, we've modeled the robots as particles, which allowed them to move in any arbitrary direction. This is good for, say, spacecraft and quadcopters, but it's not a very good model for aircraft and cars because they can't move sideways. We need a new model, a nonlinear model that restricts the algorithm from requesting that the robot moves in a way that it physically can't. One of the simplest types of nonlinear vehicle dynamics is the unicycle model. The dynamics are written out here, but I find it makes more sense just to draw a picture so you can see the relationship between position, which is x and y, and heading, which is theta. Also, u1 and u2 are the control variables velocity and heading rate that are the commands that the robot can respond to. By commanding a velocity and heading rate, you can control the heading and position of the unicycle robot. The researchers at the RAIN lab have created a version of this model as well, which they call Johnny, after Johnny 5, of course. This, this vehicle um, is, uh, is not a particle model. It's not an, it doesn't have omnidirectional wheels. It has differential drive wheels. So each of these wheels can be commanded separately. And the effect is that if they have the same velocity, they can move forward. And if they have exactly opposite velocities, they can pivot. And if you do some combination where one wheel is moving faster than the other, they can actually rotate. So we're kind of familiar with this. It's very akin to the way you drive a car. They're called differential drive vehicles. And if we took this particle model and applied it directly to this model, we'd get into trouble. Um, because it would say, for example, sometimes, translate to the right. And this model doesn't have the ability to translate directly to the right. Um, to be able to get to the right, you'd have to sort of turn, or you'd have to pivot and turn, or something like that to be able to translate to the right. So now they use their Johnny robots to test out their unicycle consensus algorithms, the simplest of which I'll describe here. Let's say that you have multiple robots and you want every one to maintain the same bearing. If we consider all robots have a constant velocity, u1 equals v, then we can write a simple bearing algorithm like this, where the change in an individual robot's heading depends on the summation of the error between its own heading and all of its neighbor's headings. If we step through one cycle, I think it'll make a lot of sense. The heading rate for vehicle 1 is the sine of theta 1 minus theta 1, plus the sine of theta 2 minus theta 1. The first term goes to 0, and the second term is negative since theta 2 is less than theta 1. This causes theta 1 dot to be negative, which moves theta 1 in the direction of the second vehicle. The opposite is true for vehicle 2. This is called the Kuramoto model, and over time the bearings of all the robots will converge. With this model there is also the idea of a grounded node. Here there is a single leader unicycle, and when Eric sets it on a new path, the rest of the swarm eventually converges to that exact same bearing. These bearing consensus algorithms could also be applied to other applications. Here, multiple spacecraft are synchronizing to the same attitude based on a single grounded node. There's an assumption that I've made during this entire video, that the person operating the robot swarm is knowledgeable about how to operate robot swarms. It requires that the person know which heading they want the robots to move in or where exactly they want them to meet. But in order for technology like this to be useful to the general public, then the interface must be much simpler. Yeah, I mean, that's actually an active area of research um, called like, aptly uh, human swarm interaction. Um, and the idea is that if, if you scale these, these swarms up to have tens or hundreds or thousands of agents, suddenly it really is impossible to have people commanding each one of these agents. So now um, we try to develop algorithms so that if a human wants to issue high-level commands like everybody translate or everybody expand or acquire a new type of formation, you know, those types of things, the formation itself can disseminate those commands and do something that you would expect. So now you're treating the swarm as a kind of meta vehicle and you're, you're flying that meta vehicle rather than a single particular agent. With human swarm interaction, the idea is that um, you want an untrained operator to be able to issue high-level commands to the swarm. The arrow means go. Black and white is basically just drawing colors. 
Okay. Um, if I do a star. Yep, and then hit go. Hit go. Now the idea is that the robots will try to acquire that shape, and they are running a distributed algorithm to try to acquire that shape. Okay. Um, and it's actually, if you... I probably gave it too many lines for the number of... No, no, of it's actually good. Um, well, if you see it on this, it acquired the shape that. as best as it could, um, given, <laughs> given the constraints. Now you might be asking, what can we use these robotic swarms for? Well, imagine this scenario. A park ranger is looking for a lost hiker. He has knowledge of the terrain and wants to command a swarm of UAVs to cover a search area. The UAVs might have infrared sensors and are looking for body heat of the lost hiker. By drawing on a touchscreen tablet with a map of the region overlaid, he can indicate the search area. The UAVs will cooperatively negotiate their relative positions for optimal coverage. The individual vehicles will move in a direction so that it will either give to or remove area from a neighboring vehicle. What I've shown in this video is just the beginning of robotic swarm research. As you can imagine, there are a lot of problems that need to be solved in this field and are being solved by the researchers of the RAIN labs. For example, one downside of cooperative robotic control is that the dynamics of the swarm are now coupled so that if a wind gust perturbs a single vehicle, the disturbance will propagate through the whole swarm. Or, how do you balance workload across multiple agents, like in this firefighting example, where more UAVs must rendezvous at the fire front and less at the areas where there is no fire, all while making sure that they don't collide with each other and they autonomously go back to their station to refuel. If this type of research is something that you'd like to be a part of, or if you're just interested in finding out more information on the topic, I put links in the description below to things like the RAIN Lab and also some of the research papers that are being written on the subject. I encourage you guys to go and check them out. They're pretty interesting and they're going to give you a lot more information than I gave you in this video. Also, I want to thank Dr. Airly Chapman, Eric Shoof, Dr. Mehran Mezbahi, and the rest of the team over at the University of Washington for showing me all the cool stuff that they're working on and letting me show it to you guys. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below and one of us will do our best to try to answer it. And as always, thanks for watching. Mehran, Dr. Yes. Mehran Mezbahi, faculty advisor. Yes, that's it. That's it? <laughs> so I'm Mehran Mezbahi, I'm a faculty member in the Aero Astro Department. It's William E. Boeing Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Uh, I, my uh, work is mostly on control systems for aerospace. Hi, I'm Dr. Erle Chapman and I'm a postdoc in the RAIN Lab and I work on distributed, distributed systems, for example, multi-vehicle control, um, and uh, the theory behind it as well as some of the applied. Hi, I'm uh, Eric Schuf and I work on uh, human swarm interactions. So how does a, a single untrained operator command many, many robots uh, where it's unfeasible to command them individually? Hi, I'm, I'm Anjik. I'm a postdoctoral researcher. My research is about the uh, navigation and control system for spacecraft. We're going to talk about that next. Yep. I'm excited. Yeah, we'll I'm Matthias Hudobudabadin, and I'm working on constructing like network topologies that sort of optimize uh, controllability of networks, and sort of looking at how the properties of the topologies of the networks influence their controllability. 